Because listen, you and I live in a world where we can't watch a TV drama, we can't watch a miniseries, we can't go to the movies, we can't even sit and watch a Super Bowl game without being pushed upon more immoral and unbiblical agendas from the world today. That's the world we live in, right? It's everywhere, and here's the temptation. It's gotta be right. I mean, it can't be wrong if everyone's doing it right. Does that, does that hit close to home? So this was the attack from the outside, and we feel those temptations, but there was also an attack from the inside, and this one is way more subtle, way more subtle. Number two, Satan deceives, write this down, from the inside. Look at verse 15, or 14. Jesus says, I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold to the teachings of Balaam, and you may remember him, this is the guy who had the talking Remember this? The talking donkey, right? You remember him. Balaam's donkey spoke into, he was a prophet. You had the teachings of Balaam who taught Balak or Balak to, uh, to place a stumbling block in front of the Israelites to do two things. Circle this. To eat meat sacrificed to idols, one, and to commit sexual immorality. In the same way, you also have those who hold to the teachings of the Nicolaitans. Now, we have learned up to this point that whenever Jesus gives an, an insight or a reference to something in the Old Testament, he is leading us to do something. Remember, what does he want us to do? You know this. Or maybe you don't, I don't know. <laughs> what does he want us to do? You know this, to go back and look. Okay, so here's what Jesus is doing. Without saying, go look at the sermon or the theme or the insight from Numbers 22, he just says, Balaam. And we know, and I don't have time to do it, we know to go back and look at it. So let me give you the cliff notes. Balaam was a prophet, and he would prophesy things right, but he was a prophet against the people of God. And he was hired to go deceive the nation, and so he convinces Balak to go and entice the people of God with two things, sexual immorality and idolatry. It was so subtle, they missed it, and it took the nation from God. The same thing is probably happening with the Nicolaitans. So here's the point I wanna make. What were the two temptations? And they affect us. What were they? Number one, write this down. The first one was idolatry at the table. I want you to follow me here. Idolatry at the table. If you've ever read the Bible for any length of time, you've always wondered, probably like me, why is worshiping idols such a big deal, right? Like, is this the way we, at least the way I think? It's just a piece of wood. Why, why is that even a big deal, right? Like we think, it's just a carved item. There's nothing wrong with the carved item. It's not really that bad. Why is eating food at a festival so bad? It's the same way I think in December. Like, what's the harm of eating 50 Little Debbie's Christmas? I mean, really? <laughs> is eating all those Christmas tree cakes so bad? which is probably borderline idolatry. But anyway, anyway, somebody actually gave me this. I'm not making this up and you know who you are. This is a freeze dried Little Debbie Christmas tree cake. I'm not making this up. And it says proudly made in the good old state of Tennessee. Yeah, that's what we're known for today. Uh, what I find fascinating about this, there's no expiration date. This baby's gonna be the same 30 years from now as it sits on my, <laughs> see, probably say, well, what's the difference between this thing and, and the idols, which are pretty much the same? Here's the major difference, I want you to get this. The problem is this, eating and drinking in the first century, or eating and drinking in that culture was more than a meal, okay? When you ate and drank in the festival of the false gods, what you were doing is you were engaging in a mutual bond of loyalty and devotion that was covenantal. Here's how you think of it. The Gentile world believed that when you had a festival for the gods, you were supposed to have a seat at the table at the breakfast or dinner table where you would invite the false god into your home to be a part of your meal. In a sense, the false god was the guest of honor at the table, why? Because you wanted to form a bond with them. 
So it's way more than just food. It was the ritual behind the food. And so when you ate the food with the idols, here's what happened. Whoever you were, you open yourself up to the spiritual forces behind the idol. Think of it this way. The activity that you engaged in was demonic in the sense of you invited the demonic realm into your life. It was way more than the meal. You know, when I was a teenager in New Orleans, and I think about this, it's really crazy, but uh, we used to get together with other friends and teenagers to play the Ouija board. You remember this when this was kind of a thing back then and hold your hands on and somebody would always kind of move it subtly, so you, didn't, you know, spell things out. I mean, that's really something, but, but we took it a, a step further. I remember us doing this on like a Friday night, Saturday night. We would get together with a group of people and we would have seances. And, and I went back and found I me mean, because I'm like, did I really do this? We had seances, and again, don't do this. We had seances, we'd get in a circle, we would hold hands and we would summon the queen of voodoo herself in the city of New Orleans, Marie Laveau. We say things like, you know, Marie Laveau, let us know that you're here. And at the time, it seems like it's childish, right? A bunch of kids playing. It may even seem harmless at the time. Let me tell you, from what I know now, it's anything but that. Anything but that. Anytime you and I participate in idolatry of any kind, it's never neutral on our life. It's always an evil effect on our bodies and our life. And here's how it works, watch this. Whether you go and march at a gay parade, supporting an agenda that is contrary to God's word, or whether you participate by walking at a planned parenthood rally, or whether you participate by going to the Bourbon Street of New Orleans in the middle of Mardi Gras, and you may think like it's subtle or it's benign. No, it actually opens yourself up to all kind of demonic activity. It does but it's more than that. See, it's more subtle than that. If you walk around with crystals in your pocket or you with friends decide for a bachelorette party, you're gonna go to a fortune teller to read your fortune or you're gonna engage in some spiritual new age practices or even, listen, this is how subtle it is, even to pick up your cell phone and scroll through pornography in your home, you're actually opening yourself up to a realm that is demonic. And this is what, listen, you probably say, I don't know if I agree with that. This is why Jesus shows us this. Jesus hates this kind of teaching because it skews our perspective of reality. Here's what I want you to see. The devil wants us to think that you and I are human beings having a spiritual experience. We're not. We are not human beings having a spiritual experience. Let me remind you. We are spiritual beings who are on earth having a human experience. And if that's the case, which the Bible tells us, if that's the case, then the battle you and I are fighting are not against flesh and blood. It's not a natural battle against people we can see. We are actually battling against spiritual powers and principalities of another world. And those powers and principalities are out to destroy anyone who is for their, his enemy, which is Jesus. And I know what you're thinking. I don't really believe or I'm in a spiritual battle. Well, guess what, brother? You have lost already. You have lost already. That's what Satan wants you to think. So how do you fight a spiritual battle? Not with carnal weapons. You fight them with spiritual weapons of prayer and the word and fasting and meditate. That's how you fight them, right? But that wasn't their biggest problem, although it was a problem. The second problem was bigger, and I think it applies even more. The second problem was not just idolatry at the table. The second problem was immorality in the bedroom. Immorality in the bedroom. See, what these two groups were saying, and we hear this sometimes today, listen, you're born again in Christ. You've been free from sin and the law. You don't need to obey God's laws, that rule book. Listen, your body is not sacred. It's the soul that's sacred. So who cares what you do with your body? Do what you want. If it feels good, what do we hear today? Feels good what? Do it. And listen, don't you dare let anyone tell you what to do with your body. You ever heard that? Does that sound familiar? 
I don't have time to preach on this, but the reality is you do have the right to tell someone to do with your body because it was Jesus who paid a price for your body. You were bought with a price, you're not your own. So glorify God with your body. That's what the Bible says. Another sermon for another day. Okay, back to this sermon. Let me show you why that's important though. In Revelation 21, 22, using the same book, watch this. This will rewrite some of our false theology. Listen, our bodies and our soul are interconnected. They are melded together, they're one, okay? The body's not just something we have here and discard after death. What does Revelation 22 say? When Jesus comes back, he's gonna resurrect our bodies and unite with our souls, and don't miss this, we're actually gonna be on this new earth, in this new Jerusalem, in a resurrected body. Contrary to false opinion, we are not gonna be disembodied, you know, souls just flying in eternity <laughs> with wings. And you know, that ain't biblical. It's cute. It's a great Twitter post when you retweet, it looks cute. It's not biblical. Here's how you gotta think of it. It's your soul and your body are one. Now, why is that important? Because when it comes to sin, hear me out. Young people, I want you to hear this. All sin is the same in the eyes of God. Meaning when you sin, it separates you from the intimacy of God, not sever the relationship, intimacy, fellowship with God, okay? All sin is the same, it separates you from God, but all sin does not affect the body the same. There are certain sins that affect the human body differently, and here's the point I wanna make. Sexual sin is more damaging to you than any other sin you can commit, period. This is why Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18, flee from what? Sexual immorality. Every other sin a person, here's the key, a person commits is outside of the body. When you lie, when you steal, when you hurt, when you disrespect, you're sinning against a person. But the person who is sexually immoral sins against his own what? Body. Think of it this way. It's like willingly drinking known poison in a cup to destroy your soul. Young people, again, I said, listen, but I really want you to lock into this. This is why, and even married folks, listen, this is why sex outside of marriage is so damaging. If the soul and the body are united, when two people who are not married engage in sexual activity, the two souls fuse together. Watch, I want you to get this. They are glued together. They are melded together. And we know this, right? That the connection is more than a physical act. It's a spiritual one. It's an emotional one. It's a relational one. Now watch this. If those two parties decide to break up, if those two parties try to separate or if they separate, from one another. What happens when two things glued together are pulled apart? They are ripped apart, and what happens is you rip the two souls apart, which produces a wound. Now the wound will heal over time, but the wound, if you ever cut yourself or skin your arm, a wound produces a what? A scar. If you know anything about a scar, you know that a scar has no feeling a scar can't feel anymore because it's the outer protective agent. There's no pain in a scar. So what happens to you spiritually, emotionally, is that you now become calloused to the person you love and to future people who come in your life emotionally. Now, you know what I'm talking about because some of you are like, I know exactly what that's like. This is the reason why some of you have a hard time today being intimate with another person. You have a scar on your soul and you don't know why. It's because your, scar, your soul is scarred from sexual sin. Look at me, it's the same thing that happens when you look at porn. You, 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 you create a wound, pull away, you, you, know, you separate, you watch something else, it's a scar and then it's a wound. Here, here's a way to think of it, I wanna draw it for you. You know, they don't let me have the whiteboard often because I, I like to teach from the whiteboard and uh, but if we had the whiteboard, we'd be here for an hour and a half. So, and some of you are like, really? 
What's taking so long to get in the doors? It was me, I'm sorry. Okay, here's how it works. Well, I like to draw on the whiteboard, a lot, a lot of my discipleship groups. And one day I had a bunch of markers and I grabbed the marker and I started teaching like I normally do. And I just wrote on the board, uh, I was just teaching on sin, I think it was, and I was writing on sin. And I, I was, I mean, when I, when I write, guys know my D group, I mean, the whole board's filled up and I'm teaching on the lesson. And when I finish, like the whole board of my office is, is marked up. And I go to grab the marker and I'm like, okay, let me tell you about, I'm like, wait a minute. And, and, and you wouldn't believe it. I look at that marker that's in the bag of array, the dry erase markers and it's a permanent marker. Anybody ever done this before, by the way? <laughs> After your heart sinks, you're like, okay, I should be able to clean it. There's no cleaning this off. There's no, I mean, you can rub, you can wipe, it does not come off. And the point of this is this, when you sin sexually, come in close, it is a stain that is permanent on your soul. It's like willingly drinking poison. And it doesn't just affect your intimacy with other people. It actually affects intimacy with God, it affects intimacy with self. So here's my, my challenge to you, look at me. If you're right now dating someone who said, man, I love you, I care about you, and you're not married, and you are presently engaged in sexual activity, listen, I'm begging you, because of this and, and, and your soul is too precious, stop it and repent and seek purity. Maybe you're in here today and, you're, and nobody knows this, but you and the other person, you are married, but you are presently engaged in an adulterous affair of immorality outside of marriage with another person. I'm telling you, listen to me, I'm begging you, stop it and repent and run to God. 